Hey, so we're continuing our series today in uh, what makes a policy good. And we're talking about index universal life insurance policies designed for maximum cash and accumulation and ultimately tax-free supplemental retirement income. Today, we're gonna be focusing on index allocation options. And there's a lot of policies out there. And because there's a lot of policies out there with a lot of different companies, there's tons of different index options available. So what do you need to concern yourself with when it comes to looking at index options and determining whether or not you're working with a company that's you know gonna be best for you long-term. So let's talk about it. The first thing that I just wanna make sure we talk about is number one, there's all kinds of different index options out there and a lot of them are relatively new. So there's tons of new allocations that pop up from time to time. And right now, most of them are in the space of this uh, volatility control. And uh, volatility control index, just to make it kind of really simple to explain, somebody is managing the index based on volatility. And they're probably moving money between equities and bonds uh, based on the, the volatility index or based on volatility in the market. And the reason that a lot of these came about is because people were trying to avoid 2008. Uh, so a lot of people started working on these volatility control index options to see if, hey, if we had had these prior to 2008, could we have avoided the 2008 crash? And of course, when you have the answers to the test, right, when these are being built in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2020, the answer is, yeah, of course you can build an index that misses 2008 when you know what happened in 2008 and you can kind of retrofit your index to how history performed. Uh, so yes, on paper, a lot of these look really good, but here's what you need to know about volatility index options. You need to know the inception date. That is, when did this index actually start getting used? Uh, and so a lot of times it'll look like this. The 30 year, they'll probably call it a back test or a back cast or you know, the 30 year back tested return was, I don't know, I'm just making this up, was 8%. Uh, and then uh, there'll be like little asterisks and there'll be some fine print and it'll say, I wonder if I can zoom this in. No, I can't zoom it in. I was gonna try to zoom it in and make it like super small so you couldn't see it, but it looks like I can't figure that out. So uh, you'll see an asterisk on that page and it'll say um, uh, inception date, something like, you know, April 15th, 2018. And you'll say, well, wait a second, but I thought you said the 30 year historical return was 8%. But now you're telling me that this index wasn't even around until 2018. So how are you getting, okay, well, what you need to know is the 30 year return is this is how the index would have performed had it existed. And I ask you, does that matter at all? I would say, no, it doesn't because it didn't actually happen. <laughs> they built it with the answers to the test. So uh, that's not to say that these can be bad. These can absolutely work. But I just want to caution you, don't do business with a company because they have the next latest, greatest volatility control index that looks like amazing. You know, it's, it's always going to be up. You're never going to lose money on paper. When you see, you know, almost this exact word for word disclaimer below the index, hey, here's the rate of return. Oh, but also these aren't real. Okay, you just need to know that that exists. So that brings us to what, what makes a policy good? You know, that's the start of the series. What makes one of these policies worthwhile? What makes it good long-term? And I'm saying a plethora of index options is what you want. And a lot of the new options are these volatility control index options. So how do you weigh them? I'm gonna tell you how. Here's how I would weigh them. So I've got a screenshot here of um, some different index options. And uh, so this would be, uh, I believe this is like a Symmetra screenshot and an Allianz screenshot. So both of them have volatility options. Uh, the, the Allianz contract has the Bloomberg and the PIMCO. Both of those are volatility controlled index options. Now in the case of 
The Bloomberg Index, it's actually been around for a little while, and so it does have a real track record. Uh, I believe it's got a 15 year, yeah, it does. It has a 15 year track record. Uh, one thing I do like about, at least in All Ants' case here, is they, they are relatively intellectually honest because they're not quoting you a 25 year return on the PIMCO Index because it didn't exist. And so they're saying, hey, not applicable. We can't we can't go back 25 years. It, it wasn't there. Um, so I do like that. Uh, and then same thing with the Symmetra policy, which I believe is the screenshot above. You know, we have this Putnam dynamic low volatility. There's that volatility word in there. So they've got their volatility index. And then they've got this JP Morgan Efficient 5 uh, and and kind of these. These are kind of volatility index option. So they both have them. Are they any good? I mean, time will tell. I don't know. But here's what I know about both of these options. You have multiple options. So there's several different options that are not just volatility index options that are unproven. And the additional options are not just S&P options. And so that's what we see a lot of the time. A lot of these companies that come out and pitch this new high flying index, they maybe have one of those index options that has an inception date in the last five years, and yet they're quoting you a 30 year return. And the fallback options are relatively non-existent. So in the case of these two policies that we're looking at here, and this is not an endorsement of these contracts, I just need you to understand um, how the game is played, so to speak. So. In both of these two options, uh, Symmetra has the other volatility options as a fallback. They have the JP Morgan uh, ETF, and then they have this blended 500 and JP Morgan, so kind of like a combo index. And then they have just their straight up S&P index with a 10% cap. Uh, and they have, of course, their volatility index. So they've got several options here that are not just volatility and not just S&P. And the big thing on the S&P is their cap is higher than 10. Okay, that's important. The cap is higher than 10. So the fallback option being the S&P doesn't just completely, you know, it's not a train wreck. And that's what we want. Uh, with Allianz, it's a similar story. So they have their two uh, volatility index options. They have the PIMCO and then they have the Bloomberg. They have the S&P as a fallback option with an 1175 cap. So that's obviously better than the Symmetra at 10. And then they also have an S&P monthly sum at 3.8 and they have a blended index at 1275. Uh, their blended index is Dow, Barclays US Aggregate Bond Fund, Russell 2000 and Euro stocks. So, so there's some fallback options here if one of the volatility options that do have the highest historical numbers, right? So when we look at these two volatility options, they do have the highest historicals. So if someone was out here saying, hey, you need to do business with Allianz because they have the very best, you know, whatever, and look at their numbers, they can't be beat. Well, we don't know how those are gonna perform in the future. Uh, it does look like they've performed well in the past, but if they don't perform well in the future, you know, what's the fallback option? Well, they actually do have a good fallback option with their S&P at 1175 and a decent track record there. So that's a good thing. That's what you want to see. You don't want to put all your eggs in the unproven, untrusted, brand new index basket with no fallback options. That should go without saying. Let's look at some others because not everybody does it that way. I want to show you an example uh, of some companies that maybe don't have great fallback options. So here's two. Uh, we have our our two kind of like fancy index options, you know, new fancy index options. Uh, no caps, which kind of tells you to, that it's a volatility controlled option. We have the same thing here below. We'll switch to the highlighter. We have this fidelity index. So this is the North American policy. Fidelity index is brand new. It's volatility controlled. You know, they quote you uh, an, an awesome uh, historical rate, and yet it's a brand new index. And so it's the same situation we just talked about. But in these two scenarios, what I want to point out is the fallback options are garbage. Okay, so if these don't work well, what are you left with? You're left with something that's worse than really the rest of the industry. So in the, in the top section here, you know, if these two volatility options don't play out the way that we want them to, what do we have left? It's 100% S&P based. So every, every other option here besides the volatility index is S&P based. And our S&P cap is 925, 925, 6.5 or 6.75. So not over 10. Symmetra was at 10. 
The all ounce policy was 1175. Uh, and you know, don't quote me on those numbers because these caps change all the time. I'm just showing you this at a point in time for, for context, okay? The fallback options here are worse than the fallback options that we just looked at. So if you're just comparing this in a vacuum and the only point uh, that you're making your decision on is based on the index options that are available, you want the volatility option that has the best fallback options if it doesn't work, because we've never seen these volatility index options in a period of rising interest rates. I'll say it again. We've never seen any of these volatility options work in a period of rising interest rates because they were all created prior to interest rates rising. And so the track record is based on interest rates falling. So when you look at those 30 year back tested numbers, that's a period of time where interest rates are falling and the, and the performance looks good. We're not in that period anymore. Is it gonna continue to work that way? Nobody knows. So you should know what your fallback option is. The second one down here is I think a little bit worse. So we have the Fidelity Index and then it's pretty much all S&P based, except we do have this, this Russell, which has an eight and a quarter cap. And then we have, let's make it bigger. We have this uh, S&P mid cap, which also is an eight and a quarter cap. Uh, we have the monthly point to point at 3.3. .3, and then we just have our standard uh, S&P uncapped, but they take the first seven and a half percent of the return. Yeah, don't love that. Uh, and then if you just want your annual S&P, you're talking about a 9.3% cap. So I wanna wrap up this video with just discussing one other thing, and that is the fixed rates that are available to you. So when you're choosing an indexed carrier, you know it's important to understand, hey, what are your fallback provisions uh, if you do decide to move away from kind of the high-flying index that may be touted to you? It's good to know, is it all S&P? Are the caps any good? Is there any diversification outside the S&P? Yes, that's all good. You also need to take a look at the fixed account that's being offered on the policy. So I took two snapshots here below. You can see here's one fixed rate at 4.75. Hey, that's pretty good. Got our fixed rate at 5% here. That's pretty good. Uh, these change all the time, but you should at least have an understanding of really three things. If you're looking at a volatility control index, you should know when was the inception date of the index and is the return they're quoting you a real number or is it a fake back tested number? You should know the answer to that question. The second thing you should know is what are the fallback options in case that volatility index doesn't work? Or is it all S&P based? And if it is, what are the caps like? And is there a history of a low cap S&P index? You should know the answer to that question. And then the third thing is you should just have a general understanding of, you know, does this company offer a competitive fixed rate? And if you have the answer to all three of those questions, you can make a pretty good decision for yourself on whether or not, you know, the person that you're working with or the company that you're looking at is going to be the best fit for you and your situation. If you'd like a discussion about what would be the best fit for you, given your situation, I'd encourage you to reach out to us. We love helping on these policies uh, because it's something that we're passionate about. And there's a ton of misinformation in this space. And our goal is to make sure that you are armed with enough information to make an educated decision that you feel great about. And if we can get you to that point, we feel like we've done our job, no matter what your decision ends up being. So if you wanna chat, we would love to do that. Uh, you can check us out at the link in the description below. Uh, you can click on the little call card here and it'll take you to our website where you can book a one-on-one -on -one discovery call with us. We can chat about your goals and see if this is something that's gonna work for you or not. Until next time, take care.